Chapter 16 of the 2018 Diabetes Canada Clinical Practice Guidelines is on in-hospital management of diabetes. I am Janine Malcolm, the lead chapter author. This chapter was co-authored by Ilana Halperin, David Miller, Sarah Moore, Karen Nuremberg, Vincent Wu, and Catherine Yu. There are a number of updates from the 2013 Clinical Practice Guidelines for this chapter. Key changes include recommendations for screening of hospitalized patients with newly diagnosed hyperglycemia, diabetes risk factors or pre-existing diabetes with A1C, recommendations for the frequency and timing of bedside capillary blood glucose monitoring for various categories of hospitalized patients. For surgical patients, there are new recommendations for the use of IV insulin for bypass surgery to prevent surgical site infections. For all surgical patients, it is now recommended to use protocols consisting of basal bolus therapy for patients with diabetes requiring insulin therapy in the postoperative period. And finally, there are updated recommendations for glucose targets for various categories of hospitalized people with diabetes. The checklist for this chapter includes check an A1C on patients with newly diagnosed hyperglycemia, diabetes risk factors, or pre-existing diabetes if it has not been done in the previous three months. Continue pre-hospital diabetes regimen if appropriate. Otherwise, use insulin as the treatment of choice. Do not use correction scale insulin alone. Do use basal plus bolus plus correction insulin regimen and avoid hypoglycemia. In-hospital hyperglycemia is common, with approximately one-third of inpatients having been found to have hyperglycemia. Many patients have diabetes prior to admission. Hyperglycemia has a strong relationship to acute illness. Hyperglycemia both reflects and results in a number of physiological changes which decreases immune function, wound healing, and increases oxidative stress, which can further exacerbate acute illness. The acute illness can further exacerbate hyperglycemia through mechanisms such as increased stress hormones, therapies such as the use of glucocorticoids, and decreased levels of activity. The question is, however, if we were to reduce the hyperglycemia, could this result in reductions in poor outcomes for hospitalized patients? Hyperglycemia has many adverse clinical effects. Data has shown hyperglycemia is associated with increases in the risks of post-operative infection and delirium, increased resource utilization, and in renal patients, increased risks of renal dysfunction and allograft rejection. As such, identification of people at risk of hyperglycemia is important in the hospitalized population. Patients with newly diagnosed hyperglycemia or diabetes risk factors can be screened with an A1C if it has not been done in the three months prior to admission to identify patients at risk of ongoing hyperglycemia post-hospitalization. For patients with known pre-existing diabetes, an A1C may be measured, if not done in the three months prior to admission, to identify those who require glycemic optimization. For hospitalized patients requiring capillary blood glucose monitoring, the frequency and timing of the monitoring should be individualized and reflect the clinical scenario and requirements of the patient. For people who are eating, it is recommended that capillary blood glucose testing be done before meals and at bedtime. For those who are MPO, every four to six hours. For those on enteral feeds, every four to six hours. For those on IV insulin, every one to two hours. And for those who are critically ill, their blood sugars should be measured every one to two hours. In-hospital glycemic targets have been set by the Diabetes Canada Committee. These targets are in keeping with other organizations from around the world. The blood targets are as follows. In non-critically ill patients, pre-prenant blood sugars targets should be between 5 to 8 millimoles per liter with a random blood sugar of less than 10 millimoles per liter. This is a grade D consensus recommendation given that we do not have prospective randomized controlled trials that are asking this specific question. For the critically ill population, blood sugar targets are between 6 to 10 millimoles per liter. This is based on randomized controlled trial data. For the bypass surgery population, intraoperative glucose targets are 5.5 to 11.1 millimoles per liter, also based on randomized controlled trial data. And for perioperatively for other surgeries, 
Blood sugar targets are 5 to 10 millimoles per liter. For the acute coronary syndrome patient population, blood sugar targets are 7 to 10 millimoles per liter. And for women in labor and delivery, blood sugar targets are 4 to 7 millimoles per liter. When discussing insulin management strategies in the hospitalized patient, the correction scale alone regimen is insufficient. In the absence of a routine insulin regimen, correction scale insulin, which is bolus insulin on a PRN basis, is purely reactive rather than proactive and allows for hyperglycemia to occur before responding. This is inappropriate and insufficient in the hospitalized patient. Correction scale insulin alone results in variable glucose control. As you can see from this example, a patient starts out the morning with a blood sugar of 6. If he or she is ordered correction scale insulin alone, which is indicated at the side of the slide, they would not receive any insulin for their breakfast meal. They would eat their breakfast and their sugar would then rise to 14 at lunch, at which point they would receive 4 units as per the correction scale that's written and then their blood sugars would come back down to six at supper time. At dinner time, once again, if they only had the correction scale insulin alone, they would not receive any bolus insulin and their blood sugars would then rise at bedtime to 16.5, at which point they would receive six units of insulin at bedtime when they are not eating and their blood sugars would drop to three, which would then result in hypoglycemia. As you can see from this example, the correction scale insulin alone can result in a roller coaster type pattern with respect to glycemic control. Therefore, the better solution is a regimen that consists of a basal plus bolus plus correction insulin regimen. In the hospital, circumstances may warrant temporarily holding other antihyperglycemic medications because of renal or hepatic impairment. Thus, insulin is the treatment of choice. So, if we're looking at a basal and bolus correction regimen, this is what it would look like. The patient will receive the basal insulin, which is long acting insulin that provides coverage for the entire day. Then at any given meal, they would receive scheduled bolus insulin to cover their meal, plus an additional correction or top up insulin if their blood sugars are above target. This pattern would be repeated for each of their meals. There may be circumstances, however, where correction insulin represented by the green may not be necessary, and then all they would receive is merely the blue or bolus insulin. This regimen will result in smoother glucose control, and it is the recommended insulin regimen of hospitalized patients. Therefore, we'd like you to think about basal plus bolus plus correction insulin. Let's work through an example. In the basal plus bolus plus correction regimen, glycemic control is smoother. In this example, the person starts out their day with a blood sugar of 6. They eat their breakfast and receive their 6 units of scheduled bolus insulin. They do not require any additional insulin as per the correction scale written at the side of the slide. This controls them well and their blood sugar at lunch is 6. They once again eat their lunch and receive their 6 units of bolus insulin. Unfortunately, in this situation, it was not quite enough and their blood sugar then rises to 12 at dinner time. At that point, the person eats their dinner, receives their 6 units of scheduled bolus insulin, in addition to 2 extra units of correction insulin as per the correction scale at the side of the slide. This once again controls them well and their blood sugar is 6 prior to bedtime and they receive their basal insulin. The patient will not receive any correction insulin at bedtime. As you can see, the correction insulin is only scheduled for AC meals only. The other advantage of this regimen is that in two or three days time, one can go back and change the scheduled or routine dose of insulin, taking into account the correction insulin that was received. There are good data to support the concept that basal bolus insulin achieves better control than correction scale insulin alone. These are the data from the RAPID2 studies. On the left-hand panel, the results are from the medical ward, and on the right-hand panel, the results are from the surgical ward. Patients were randomized to receive either correction scale insulin alone or 
based on bolus insulin protocol. As you can see, the y-axis shows blood glucose control and the x-axis shows duration of treatment. It is quite clear from these two graphs that the basal bolus insulin regimen achieves much better glucose control and maintains that glucose control much better than correction scale alone. This slide shows the data in support of IV insulin protocols to reduce surgical site infections in patients undergoing coronary artery bypass surgery. As you can see, IV insulin protocols were significantly associated with the reduction in surgical site infections in this patient population. However, when we are discussing glycemic control in the hospital, it is important to remember that hypoglycemia must be avoided. Protocols should be in place for hypoglycemic recognition and management. These protocols should be nursing initiated. Patients at risk of hypoglycemia should have ready access to an appropriate source of glucose at all times. Insulin protocols and order sets may be used to improve adherence to optimal insulin management for glycemic control. Achieving glycemic control in the hospitalized patient can be challenging. However, institution-wide programs can result in improvements in glycemic control. Elements of programs that have been shown to improve glycemic control include interprofessional team-based care, health professional development focused on in-hospital diabetes management, algorithms, order sets, and decision support, and comprehensive institution-wide quality assurance initiatives. The recommendations for this chapter are recommendation number one, new for 2018, an A1C should be measured if not done in the three months prior to admission on all hospitalized people with a history of diabetes to identify individuals who would benefit from glycemic optimization, all hospitalized people with newly diagnosed hyperglycemia or those with diabetes risk factors to identify individuals at risk of ongoing dysglycemia, Repeat screening should be performed six to eight weeks post-hospital discharge for individuals with an A1C of 6 to 6.4%. And in-hospital capillary blood glucose monitoring should be initiated for individuals with an A1C of greater than or equal to 6.5%. Recommendation number two, the frequency and timing of bedside capillary blood glucose monitoring should be individualized for all inpatients with diabetes. Monitoring should be typically performed at the following times, before meals and at bedtime in people who are eating, every four to six hours in people who are NPO or receiving continuous enteral feeding, and every one to two hours for people on continuous intravenous insulin or those who are critically ill. Recommendation number three, provided that their medical conditions, dietary intake and glycemic control are stable, People with diabetes should be maintained on their pre-hospitalization non-insulin antihyperglycemic agents or insulin regimens as appropriate. Recommendation number four, for hospitalized people with diabetes treated with insulin, a proactive approach that includes basal, bolus, and correction or supplemental insulin along with pattern management should be used to reduce adverse events and improve glycemic control instead of only correcting high blood glucose with short or rapid acting insulin. Recommendation number five, for the majority of non-critically ill hospitalized people with diabetes, preprandial blood glucose target should be five to eight millimoles per liter in conjunction with random blood glucose values of less than 10 millimoles per liter, as long as these targets can be safely achieved. Recommendation number six, for most medical and surgical critically ill hospitalized people with diabetes with hyperglycemia, a continuous intravenous inf insulin infusion should be used to maintain blood glucose levels less than 10 millimoles per liter and greater than 6 millimoles per liter. Recommendation number seven, which is new for 2018, for people with diabetes undergoing bypass surgery, a continuous IV insulin infusion protocol Targeting intraoperative glycemic levels between 5.5 and 11.1 .1 millimoles per liter should be used rather than subcutaneous insulin to prevent postoperative infections. Also new for 2018, recommendation number eight, in hospitalized people with diabetes requiring insulin therapy, protocols using basal insulin with 
or without bolus insulin should be used for postoperative glycemic management. Recommendation number nine, in hospitalized people with diabetes, hypoglycemia should be minimized. Protocols for hypoglycemia avoidance, recognition, and management should be implemented with nurse-initiated treatment, including glucagon for severe hypoglycemia when intravenous access is not readily available. Hospitalized people with diabetes at risk of hypoglycemia should have ready access at, to an appropriate source of glucose, either oral or IV, at all times, particularly when MPO or during diagnostic procedures. Recommendation number 10, new for 2018, programs consisting of the following elements should be implemented for optimal inpatient diabetes care. Number one, interprofessional team-based approach. Number two, healthcare professional development regarding in-hospital diabetes management. Number three, algorithms, order sets, and decision support. And number four, comprehensive quality assurance initiatives, including institution-wide blood glucose monitoring systems, inpatient education, and transition and continuity of care, and post-discharge planning. The key messages for this chapter are, Hyperglycemia is common in hospitalized people, even among those without a previous history of diabetes, and is associated with increased in-hospital complications, longer length of stay, and mortality. Insulin is the most appropriate pharmacological agent for effectively controlling glycemia in hospital. A proactive approach to glycemia management using scheduled basal, bolus, and correction or supplemental insulin is the preferred method. The use of correction or supplemental only insulin, which treats hyperglycemia only after it has occurred, should be discouraged as the sole modality for treating elevated blood glucose levels. Glycemic targets for the majority of non-critically ill hospitalized patients with diabetes are preprandial 5 to 8 millimoles per liter in conjunction with random blood glucose of less than 10 millimoles per liter as long as these targets can be safely achieved. For critically ill hospitalized people with diabetes, blood glucose levels should be maintained between 6 and 10 millimoles per liter. Hypoglycemia is a major barrier to achieving targeted glycemic control in the hospital setting. Healthcare institutions should develop protocols for the assessment and treatment of hypoglycemia. Key messages for people living with diabetes. If your admission to hospital is planned, talk with your healthcare provider in order to develop an in-hospital diabetes care plan which addresses the following issues. Who will manage your diabetes in hospital? Will you be able to self-manage your diabetes? What adjustments to your diabetes medications or insulin doses may be necessary before and after medical procedures or surgery? And if you're on an insulin pump, are the hospital staff familiar with insulin pump therapy? Your blood glucose levels may be higher in hospital than your usual target range due to a variety of factors, including the stress of your illness, medications, medical procedures, and infections. And your diabetes medications may therefore need to be changed during your hospital stay to manage the changes in blood glucose or if medical conditions develop that make some medications no longer safe for you to use. When you are discharged, make sure you have written instructions about changes in your doses of medications or insulin injections or any new medications or treatments, how often you have to check your blood glucose, and who to contact if you're having difficulty managing your blood glucose levels. The full guidelines, interactive tools, and other useful resources can be accessed on the guidelines website at guidelines.diabetes.ca. The information is also accessible on the Diabetes Canada app available in the App Store or Google Play for Android. Thank you.